It's funny. I uh, used to have a real problem with something that happened to me as a born again Christian when I was in my innocent stage. <laughs> you know what I mean. When you first get saved, you know, everything is like, ooh, boo boo, becca, you know, just beautiful and wonderful and. The world is a magical place, and God is just doing all kinds of neat things, you know, and you just go, wow, boy, Lord, you know, are there any sinners out there? All I can find are saints, you know, and you, yeah, got saved in some marvelous, mystical, magical, so to speak, kingdom like Disneyland, you know, and you thought you were like, oh, on top of the world. You went along like that for a while, <laughs> and you thought you knew it all. Well, you know, in my in my foolishness, when I was a baby Christian and full of the joy and the love of the Lord, and just so filled with so many gifts and abilities, and just doing all kinds of things that are so unheard of, you know, that it was normal to me, but. I guess it's now people try to make them into conferences and go out and do supernatural things when I keep looking at it and go, but everybody can do that, really. <laughs> I mean, it's no big deal. It's not supernatural. It's normal. <laughs> but maybe some people, it's, they got to, you know, make their money somehow or do their thing. So maybe for some people it's kind of different. But for me, you know, especially with this today's devotional, I was brought back to mind of thinking about those days when the Holy Spirit was just full and filling and overflowing out of me and what a joy it was and one of the foolish prayers that God helped me to and made me accountable was that I really had a passion for God that I guess was more so than many of my peers and I didn't know that. You know. They were, some of them, you know, especially the guy that led me to the Lord, you know, I mean, he didn't really lead me, he took me to the concert, you know, in other words, he was driving, and you know, he never witnessed to me, or he never shared the gospel, he just took me, you know, so, the point being is that, Bob Pollock was his name, was that he was always wanting to get gifts of the Spirit, like speaking in tongues and other things, you know, but he wasn't really into Jesus, or knowing God, you know, and, when I got saved, you know, miraculously, boy, I was like on fire and just doing all kinds of things that I guess maybe I even aggravated him or intimidated him in some ways because after a while, he was no longer around. And to this day, I really can't remember why. <laughs> but I know that in my heart, every time I saw him and he'd talk about all these other things, I'd say, well, why do you want a gift when you could have God? Let's get Jesus. We want more of Jesus. You know, let's let's see if we can't talk to Jesus and hear him speak, you know, because he said he would. You know, and I was always about Jesus. I was always about wanting to know him more. I wanted to know God the Father in a more intimate way, like Jesus said we could. I wanted to experience the Holy Spirit in a different way, you know, complete, like Jesus said we could. I wanted to know Jesus completely as an intimate walking person and talking with me and knowing him in a real way that would be more than life itself. <laughs> And I guess I was pretty obnoxious to a lot of people. Maybe even to God. Because one day I I was in my ah, angst stage where I was arguing with God about something. And I finally said, you know, God, I don't understand why people are so wrong. Why they go off on these tangents. Why, like Romain used to say, you could open up the north door and you could open up the south door. And when the wind blew, people went. You know, they just go out blow out about a thousand people out of where church I was going to and they'd go down the street and start another church you know and usually off the wall <laughs> well, well but the point being was that I didn't understand that I didn't understand how people could get have the word of God have a Bible and go off I didn't understand because at that time I didn't have any religious upbringing. I didn't understand how churches could have gotten from where they were to where they are and how come they weren't with Jesus now. You know, I was really confused because 
I began to meet, you know, born again Catholics, born again Protestants, born again everybody. So, I mean, you know, there wasn't really any de Christian denomination that I couldn't find somebody that wasn't born again. I mean, in those days, everybody was getting saved. Especially the ones that were supposedly already Christian. <laughs> well, you know, but I argued with God. I said, you know, Lord, I don't know what it is, but I want to, I want to follow God's only son, even if I'm the only one. I want to hear when I'm done, you do well, my son. I used to sing that song over and over and over again. I pound it into the pavement. And then I'd tell God, God, I don't understand. You know, I don't want riches. I don't want glory. I don't want fame. I don't want any other thing. But I don't understand why people can't come to you just as they are. Why people don't love you for who you are. I don't understand why they would do the things they do to be distant from you. I said, I want to have an answer to give to every man for the hope that lies within me, for the reason why I have such powerful, magnificent, if it were, faith. Because God, it's not me, it's you, and I don't understand it. And I was sincere. I must have been. God heard me. <laughs> God answered me. E. So God took me on this long, I call it my Solomon phase. Long journey. Long journey. 30 years later, I'm still on that journey. <laughs> but I can say this. Don't pray that prayer. <laughs> I, I discovered my experiences in life and all that I had gone through were all designed purposely to fulfill that pr promise that God's given us, but also that word that I asked him for, to know why people believe what they do, to see where they're coming from, to understand what misconceptions they have, and it doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to convince them into anything else other than knowing why they do what they do and what they do. But in that respect, oh yeah, no problem there. Boy, the Lord led me everywhere. Man, I went into Catholic churches, to Greek Orthodox churches, to some of the cults, you know, to find out what they were doing, into Chabad of all places. I mean, God kept taking me into all these different places and I kept going. So that's what they believe. So that's why they do it. So, okay. And then I'd read about it and research it. And God would show me things and then open up doors for me to study. And I'd be going, man, my brain is going to explode. And it would just keep getting bigger and bigger. You know, and then I thought it was important. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I still think I'm important. No, I'm kidding. It's a joke. Please pray for me. But I wanted to know it all. I wanted to be able to give to every man, no matter who it was, to answer. And then one time I really went way off and almost crossed a line when it was like the early messianic movement. Man, you know, they just, they had a lot of good points, you know. And it was fun dancing. It was fun relating. You know, it was fun being a Jew and sharing with, you know, other Jews about our faith, you know, and growing together. And then, you know, with other Gentiles that would come in and how the Christian church was growing and understanding who Jesus was as a Jew but not who he is as a son of God, a son of man. So a lot of times people were making that kind of confusion. So I kind of looked at it and went, nah, I can't be right. You know, I said, they're, they're kind of going off tangent, you know. And then I found other people that said, yeah, they're going to go off tangent. Like, you know, some of the early founders of the Messianic movement. And then people like Moshe Rosen, you know, Jews for Jesus and others that pray that they would not, even chosen people. I remember meeting um, uh, Brown. I can't remember his name. But I met him up in Anchorage, and he too, from Chosen People Ministries, one of the original Jewish Christian organizations, you know, that witnesses to Jews. The, the first, you know, that um, he said too, you know, the Messianic movement's going to go off. You know, they're just, they're heading in the wrong direction. They don't get it. You know, they're trying to go into the roots and become dirty with the dirt that mankind is, rather than crawl up out of the roots into the branches and bear the fruit of what God wants to do with all of us. And I thought about that for a long time and God showed me the truth of it and sure enough, wow, you know, I, I had to, I tried to warn people but, you know, they didn't listen so they went off on their tangents and nowadays you can find a lot of messianics, you know, and messianics that are kind of legalists more than they are of God. And that's a sad story. But then likewise, I began to see how even people in my own you know, place where I got saved, like Calvary Chapel began to go off on tangents and do weird things and get kind of discombobulated and confused and they took their eyes off Jesus, it seemed like, and were going into theological things. So then I began to study theology. I said, well, how come they're going off? You know, so then the Lord led me into, oh, 
church history, church doctrine, church dogma, church everything, you know, and I studied the church from way back when, you know, to modern days. Man, I got a huge head, you know, and I went, oh, you know, but the one thing that God always did for me was that, see, I never took it as bitterness, but betterness. I wanted to get better, not bitter. So I wanted to understand how people from their generation, their explanation, their own interpretation of what they were doing at the time, at the time, and why they would be accepted then and rejected now. So I kind of, you know, studied that and God opened doors for me that, you know, I began to write about it and people began to think, oh, he's so wise. And I kept thinking, me? <laughs> I'm not smart. And, you know, I'm no genius. Although one time I did take that test, you know, I'm kind of, wow, borderline. Hey, Lord, cool. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> I have enough ego. I don't need any more. Please don't add. But my point being was that God took me out of all kinds of things in order to give me what I do got, which was understanding and mercy and grace towards all those who came to know God in the past, the present, and probably in the future. Because I really wanted to know and be able to share to anyone, anytime, anywhere, any place about everything. Really? <laughs> Boy, isn't that an egotistical prayer? Not really. It's not. You know, because my heart was right. And some of you might know what I'm talking about. You, know, you just really want to share Jesus. You don't really care who gets the glory. You know. But my point was, I really cared about these people. So I wanted to know. So God honored it and you know, I missed out on all these other things, you know, where people would go off on these giant, maybe, things that seem to last for a little while. Or, you know, I might get the chance to participate on the edges or behind the scenes, but never really in the big, full growth thing, you know, like, you know, some of the people I knew began to become mega people, you know, like Calvary Chapel, Riverside became Harvest, or, you know, Mike was down in Dago, and, you know, John Corson was up in, up in Applegate, you know, and man, people all around me were like doing all kinds of neat things. And after a while, I started saying, but Lord, what about me? Don't you love me? Don't you care about me? And then, of course, Jesus would come to me and share with me, you know, that others may do these things, you know, and have great ministries and if you ever want to look up something about who I am, you really want to know where I come from, um, look up the words, others may, you may not. Google it. Just others may, you may not. And you'll find a poem, or a poem, you'll find a devotional in there. And God gave me that, and I accept it as me and who I am. And I posted it in my ministry at different times, you know, or the ministry the Lord's given me at different times on webs and even wrote, read it, I think, once on a video. But, you know, check it out. You can look it up and see <laughs> what the Lord gave me, you know, about why, you know, and what, you know, I have. And today's devotional, the only reason I brought all this up was because it talks about it in the first line. And I find myself at the end of my life, you know, which I believe we're in the last days, you know, it's not going to happen this year, 2011. It's not going to happen 2012, but <laughs> and God help you on the rest of the years <laughs> because we're pretty sure about when, you know, but we're just going to say from any time from 2013 onward, just be on the safe side. God help you. But may God lead you and God protect you and God take care of you, whatever way God chooses to use you. But I find myself sometimes saddened by seeing sometimes people misled and led off astray and knowing full well they're wrong. I mean, just knowing it, you know, knowing why they're wrong, where they're wrong, how they're wrong, how they got there, what they're doing. Usually what the next step is that they're going to really go into. And that's hard. I mean, if you're if you're a loving, caring, compassionate person that God wanted you to be in the first place, and God has just simply added knowledge to that in order for you to be more compassionate, more forgiving, more loving, more merciful, then you find yourself grieved like the Holy Spirit is over what happens to people when they take their eyes off of Jesus and they seek a prize more than the person. 
They seek a crown and a reward more than the giver of the crown itself. You see, Jesus himself may reward you. God may give you those things that he's promised you. But if you're not spending the time with God, you may be grieving the Holy Spirit for the reason of why he was sent here. For me, I love what I have with the Lord. You know, there are times I take it for granted. It's true. There are times I have faith that is so almost belligerent that, you know, I expect God to answer. I expect God to do. I expect Him. Because my great expectation is always in Him, in Him and through Him. I don't have any expectation of mine. I expect to sin, you know, from the day I was born till the day I die, you know. But I expect also that He's going to present me faultless before the Father with exceeding joy, you know, that He's going to perfect that which concerns me, that that which is of me and in me, that He will bring out in the end all that he wanted to accomplish through me and it'll all be done for his glory so don't get mistaken by what i'm about to say or that i do say that i have an answer for everyone who asks me the hope that life will be because i really do i have an answer you want to spend three days on it no problem come on over man we'll talk <laughs> my wife knows <laughs> the guy won't shut up you get if you want to talk about jesus he will stop everything in order to talk about Jesus. That's no problem. If you want to argue, well, you know, we could do that. I've been in Jerusalem. I live there. I, I know how to argue. Such a deal, you know. We had lots of rabbinic students come out, you know, and we used to stand around and not to you, the, you know, we'd argue right there in the square, you know, and all our hands would be flying and we'd be talking and we'd be doing this, doing that, and that, you know, and even had one, one, Student come running at me, you know, and try to bump me, you know, because it's kind of like fun to thing to do when you're a bunch of you know, young people and you want to kind of you think you're going to put one over on the guy, you know, and knock him off his point of view. <laughs> but the point is, it was humorous, and then his Israeli soldier came along and cleared us all out of the square, you know. And they have a great way of doing it. They just shove you. <laughs> all of you. <laughs> no question about, are they partial? Nope. Everybody gets shoved out of there. Wow, wow. And he's wearing a good, so he just pushes. Go. And you go. <laughs> no questions asked. And you're just gone. You know, you disperse. But my prayer for you is that you would learn more of the Lord than desire to know more of the Word, meaning that the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, all these other things that might distract you, words of theology, words of man, words of everything else that attracts you. Because right now in the world, on the internet and in the quote unquote news services, there's this whole temptation that's being presented to you to attract the lust of the eye, to bring about some kind of pride of life that you're not one of those but you're one of these so that you can be with us so that we can say these things about them no you can't and then the lust of the flesh is being appealed to by everything whether it be some news anchor sitting there in a mini skirt you know or some news service that presents only gorgeous looking women or some other service that tries to intellectually stimulate your mind by presenting all these spins that are on top of what some little short story article comes out from a new service that's only one line long. Be wise as serpents and gentle as doves, gentle as lambs. Rather, turn to the Lord and seek to know Him more than what the world knows. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Boy, I took that so right on for me. <laughs> First John 2.20 God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, and with power. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Of his fullness have we received and grace for grace. You see, there's a way to get fullness, but that's only if you have the right attitude. Because these people that are running around with the gifts of the Spirit and anointing and whatever, appointing, God may honor their anointing. But what they're appointed to, they may have already received. They may not get anything when they finally arrive in heaven, if they arrive there. So, 
God has appointed us, but it's grace for grace. You need to understand that. You are meant to share grace. You're meant to be merciful. You're meant to be loving, forgiving, kindness, meekness, temperance, gentleness, love, joy, and peace. Not taking credit and glory where glory is due to God. Thou anointest my head with oil. The anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. People often tell me that, you know, hey, I've got this mega video series I want you to watch. And I say, but I've got the Lord. I've got this, you know, magnificent teaching I want to share with you, but I've got the Lord. i got all this, I've got, but i got the Lord. I wish people would just take the Lord and run with it and even not watch me. But if I can make you be inspired to go seek Jesus on your own with the Holy Spirit, opening his word or talking to him direct, then I would say, go do that. You don't need to hear me. I don't need to teach you. I am not here as your teacher. I am here as a guide to point you in the right direction to he who is going to teach you. And that is the Holy Spirit. That is God himself. That is Jesus talking to you. It's always been about that. It's always going to be about that. It is always going to be the focus, not only of this ministry, but of our lives, all of us. It's all about Jesus or it's none about us because otherwise we have no salvation. If it's not about him, you're on the wrong end of that decision that you're making. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. It's what Jesus has said to us that the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance. People tell me all the time, memorize this, memorize that. 37 different tricks to know how to memorize. I haven't memorized any scripture. I think I memorized one. Press the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Other than that, I don't memorize. Sorry. I thought God was going to remind me. And if you get to know me very well, you'll probably see he does a good job. <laughs> Familiarity causes remembrance. If you just simply read it over and over again, you're going to remember it. My wife remembers things now that she said she doesn't memorize either because she can't remember. She can't even remember what she read, she says, but she does and she doesn't know it because the Holy Spirit at the moment that she needs it causes her to remember. It isn't about us. It's about him. Remember, when it's not about us, point to him and you're going to be fine. The Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Don't worry about how you pray, and don't worry about what you pray. Just say it, get it over with, get done with it, and get on with it. That's the way I am. I'm like, hey God, if the Holy Spirit's going to interpret, I mean, I already had this conversation with God before. God, if the Holy Spirit's going to interpret it anyway, so does it really matter how much I pray, and which way I pray, and what words I say? Or can I go ahead and just say, God, you take care of it, and by way of God being the Holy Spirit, that he could go ahead and interpret it for me. He knows my heart, my intentions, and what I want, because he just saw how I read it, and whatever some person asked me, he already knows what it is that I need to pray, so he's going to go and pray for me anyways in the right way that it needs to be prayed. So I'd rather just go, God, you take it, you do it, you fill it, you fulfill it, however way you want to do it. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe I'm right. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. If the blood of bulls and of goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall all, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much easier it is to not be convicted by everyone telling you what to do, but to be convinced by what the Holy Spirit is showing you he's done. He's done it. He did it. We don't have to do dead works. We can do righteousness. The blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Do the bad works. Cain and Abel. Hey, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It costs 
to be a Christian, and it costs to have a relationship with God. But what it cost has been paid for by the death of Jesus Christ, by the death of the only begotten Son of God, who died for you and gave himself for you, and who loves you enough to be resurrected from the dead, to come and live in you, so he could speak to you, so he could love through you, to the world, to show them the love the Father has for them. So let God out, so he can do what he wants to be about. He wants to use you, but you got to let him out. So just share what it is that Jesus has brought into your life and how Jesus is related in your world and how Jesus is your salvation. And you've got the entire plan of God and his will for your life. It's that simple. Don't go after all the knowledge in the world. Go after knowing Jesus. Thank <laughs> you.